Hi friends, oh boy. I'm glad, hopefully, you can hear me. I am so glad to see you here. My name is Emily. I am from the Ann Arbor Library, but I'm extra excited to be here because it's another wonderful Nerd Night. Yeah, Nerd Night's great. Uh, we have a great themed event tonight that all of our talks just ended up perfectly fitting in to learn about lasers, lights, and llamas. So, I know, really exciting stuff. But I noticed, as I was saying hello to folks who are coming in, we have a lot of new faces here tonight. Uh, and as our regulars know, even if we didn't have a lot of new faces, you'd still probably hear the same story of me, uh, which is the Nerd Night origin story. Meet this guy. This is Chris. Uh, Chris was a graduate student in the mid-2000s, uh, and he was studying evolutionary biology. But as every good grad student knows, he usually had a secondary study, which was studying of drinking at your favorite bar. And if you were Chris, your favorite bar was the Midway Cafe in the Jamaica Plains neighborhood in Boston. So Chris... Uh, every summer, as part of his research, would go and travel to Cameroon. And he would travel to Cameroon specifically to study the indigo bird. Look at this little sweetie, what a joy to study. But then, if you look real close, you see those dead, cold eyes. That is because the indigo bird is a savage killer. Here's how it works. So an indigo bird is a type of bird uh, referred to as a cowbird, essentially. It takes, when mama bird is ready to lay her eggs, she goes to another nest where there's another mama bird and there are other eggs. And she lays her indigo bird egg and flies off to continue the evolutionary cycle. So then uh, when the indigo bird egg hatches, uh, it savagely kills all of the other eggs and all of the other birds who maybe came there first. So it is the only surviving bird. And poor mama bird, who doesn't even realize that this baby isn't hers, takes care of this little indigo bird until it becomes that cutie once again, and it, this circle just perpetuates and perpetuates, thus being studied by evolutionary biologists. So we're going to go back to Chris, that evolutionary biologist, because after he'd go on this trip, He'd go back to his favorite bar. And he'd sit at the bar, and like you do when you've been out of town for a long time doing something kind of cool, you invite a friend to come out, and you sit, and they ask you, how was your trip? And he'd tell them the story of this jerk bird. And then the next day, he'd have a different friend, and he'd go, and he'd tell the story of the jerk bird. And the next day, new friend, same story, also same bartender. And at one point, they said, hey, Chris, we've had enough. I cannot hear about this jerk bird one more time. OK, fine. One more time. We're going to close down the bar to everything else. We're going to cancel trivia night. You invite all of your friends for this last jerk bird telling. Uh, we'll give you a projector. We'll hand you a microphone. Just only one more time. And so Chris did that. He invited his friends, and the bar filled up, and he told his jerk bird story. And the bar said, hey, actually, this might be a good idea. And thus, Nerd Night was born and then spread everywhere. Tonight, not only are there Nerd Nights in Ann Arbor, uh, there are also in Orlando, in Asheville, and tomorrow there's one in Tokyo. They're all over the place. But I'll let you in on a secret. The best one's right here in Ann Arbor. And part of that is because of how it works. It's sponsored by the library, so you didn't have to pay a cover when you came in. Uh, we love AADL. I'm very selfish about it, but they're great. We also love live. Who else would open up their nightclub early so that a bunch of nerds could come in and sit and listen to talks? So thank you, live. And of course, we would not be here without all of you. So thank you, nerds. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming back. Uh, it's always a lovely way to spend a Thursday night. Uh, but finally, we definitely wouldn't be here if it weren't for our wonderful speakers. Uh, so tonight we have Mike Gould, who's going to t take us through time and space with Illuminatus lasers. Woo. We have Saj Chattopadhyay, who is going to tell us how she asks molecules what their political leanings are with the help of a gold echo chamber. And then we'll close things out with Mary Skinner, who's going to tell us about nanobodies, llamas, science, and tech. Oh, my. 
So without any more talking from me, I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Mike Gould. Mike is a Michigan-based laser graphics, video, and electronics artist uh, from Illuminatus Lasers. And guess what, guys? He brought some tonight. So join me in welcoming Mike. Well, all right. It's good to be back. I was here about six, eight years ago to do this same sort of thing. So like she said, I'm Mike Gould, director of Luminatus Lasers. And for the last 11 years, we've been doing laser shows with Full Moon, which is a nighttime uh, art event, which is coming up April 5th. Uh, I'm not sure that we'll be there, but uh, we hope to. At any rate, this is the very first time we did this. We got up on top of the Mongolian barbecue with a bunch of projectors and projected across the street onto the First National Building. Now, how we got up there, uh, here I am on my way to the venue. Uh, we had to hoist all the gear on ropes because this ladder here was the only way to get up. So uh, that's what we did, and we hoisted all the projectors up. This is uh, Cornell Desai, who's one of our engineers. These are the projectors, the leftover from uh, Art Prize in Grand Rapids, if you've ever been there. This is what they look like on the inside. That's the laser. There's some circuitry here. The laser goes through a rotating tube, which has been tormented uh, using a blowtorch, and it, so it's all warped, and it tends to warp the laser beam. Then that warpage goes through a rotating disc, which is made out of textured glass. So you go in your shower, you get your glass cutter, cut out a disc, and that's what you end up with. And this is what controls it. This was built by our engineer, Wayne Gillis. Uh, we have six channels. You can control uh, masters and directions and all that other good stuff. So the following year, we were behind the Ann Arbor um, Garden Supply Store, that little alley back there, shining on the back of the newly uh, constructed apartment building back there. So we had a pretty good crew, and they're all bundled up. This is like early April. And of course, it was raining and snowing and 40 mile an hour winds and stuff like that there. Loads of fun. OK, there's some more uh, setting up. Now, this is semi-interesting. Uh, this is a uh, laser projector that Wayne and I built into a beer barrel. And its name is Brewster which is hilarious if you happen to be a laser scientist. And we also built one into a vacuum cleaner. And you'll see these uh, later on a bit. That one's called the Extra Lux. Uh, this is what the inside of the uh, beer barrel looks like. There are three lasers. There's uh, a big green one and a red one, which was built by Bob Snyder, who's right over there. Yay. And, and a blue one there. And they are combined optically to get a white laser, essentially, which you can then turn on and off under contr uh, computer control to make different colors and to make it jump around. And while it's jumping around, you can do scrolling text. And one of the scrolling text things we did was thanking our sponsors, including Ann Arbor Library. And that's what that was. Yes. Big fun. And this is called Lumia. You saw some of this earlier. And that's what it looks like upside the wall there. And that's what it looks like on the inside. Again, it's a, uh, a red laser, a green laser, and a blue laser combined optically using dichroic filters and other uh, mumbledy mumbledy. Uh, and then it goes through a, uh, a scanner, and it goes out the other way, door. Now, I'm an artist, which means I have no money, so I can't really buy this stuff. So I have to build it myself, and that's, that's what I've done. And that's me. It was, of course, pouring rain, and I'm under a tarp doing last-minute programming with a laptop. Now, the following year, we were out on Washington Street, and it was delightful. It was sunny and ever so much warmer, and we had the crew out there hanging up the projectors. So we've got the Lumiators, which are these guys, and then we've got our graphics projectors, the beer barrel and the... Uh, vacuum cleaner, there goes the beer barrel, and those were projecting uh, thank yous and scrolling text over here, while the Lumiators were illuminating 
this wall over here. And the other thing we did was we decided to let kids play with the stuff. So we built controllers that were built into these little uh, toolbox thingies, and we set them up so that the kids could play with them. And so they did. And they had a wonderful time doing that. And that was what they were controlling. And they were all agog, and rightfully so. Big fun. Oh, and there's the, the uh, Brewster and the Extra Lux. And that's what it looks like. And the other thing we had was dancing with lasers, dances with lasers. We aim a connect at a dancer, and we hook it up to the laptop, and we can project the outline of the dancer. And we can also do logos and all that good stuff. Some more of our controls. We had some celebrities drop by. There's the violin monster doing his number. And we have this thing called Fanboy, which is a laser through a big diffraction grating, which splits up the beams. And if there's stuff in the uh, air, particulate matter, you can see the beams. And that's what you see right there. So there's some more of our overall setup. That was the team. Uh, Bob right here was, uh, and Tim right here are both at the back. We thank them for helping us out here. And that's dancing with lasers in the snow. So you can see the snow coming down through the lasers and projecting there on the wall. Following year, it was not snowing, but it was really, really cold. But we managed to get our stuff together, and the cool part is we were able to buy some actual commercial laser projectors made by a company called Quant. They're made in uh, the Slovak Republic, and they cost $3,200 a piece, which is why it took a while. To get them, I did lasers for the movie called Hereditary, and I made some money doing that, which enabled us to, to buy some of this stuff. We got our power from a street light, which we then covered up with a bag to keep ambient light down. And this time, instead of the uh, little two boxes, I built controllers into lunch boxes. So the kids are now playing with lunch boxes and having a wonderful time and dancing and there they all dressed up in their finery and running the lasers. And then it snowed. But that's okay. We're tough. We can deal with it. You can see we got a lunchbox. We got a bunch of controls. That's what the kids are dealing with. And that's our resident furry Draco uh, doing his thing. So the following year, we were at the farmer's market. And we're projecting on Carytown there. And we had the dances with lasers down a little bit better as you can see. So here we are setting up. Uh, that's my wife Sally uh, and Tom Bray behind. Sally's back there. She couldn't do without you, honey. And there's the kids at the uh, lunch boxes and dances with lasers. We did have a fairly uh, calm night. The problem is when you got fog, the wind can blow it all away, but we had some fog so we could see the laser beams. And there we have them on the side of Carytown. Now, one reason we don't like to work with, laser, with computers a lot, uh, the software that was controlling the dances with lasers was old software talking to new hardware. And every once in a while, it would glitch out like this. I think it had a memory leak or some damn thing. At any rate, we'd have to shut it all down, reboot the computer, start all over again, major pain in the ass. We have since uh, figured out a fix for that. We had a much bigger crew for that one, as you can see. Then the following year, COVID hit, so we couldn't be out in the streets. So we decided to do a virtual version. So this is my workshop, and I set it up, and then I videoed it, and I streamed it, and it was online. So that's my desk in my workshop there with the uh, uh, couple, three computers uh, doing the streaming and whatnot. That's one of my main work tables covered with uh, projectors. In the background, you can see all our other gear. In the background here, you can see my drill press and bench grinders and uh, uh, bandsaw and all that other good stuff. This is a nine-foot-wide photographic paper backdrop. Now, the following year, COVID was less of a thing, so we were on Main Street in front of the Blue Llama Club. So we had their logo up there, and we had this new thing 
called the radiator, which makes these wonderful Lisa shoe patterns. Uh, we were able to cram all the gear into my van once again and uh, set it all up. Uh, Bradley Cross and uh, Wayne Gillis setting up there. And that's the combined mess. We had uh, logos, we had Lumia, and we had this wonderful Lisa shoe stuff going on. The Blue Llama. So this is a radiator. We had two of them plugged into the uh, projectors making the cool lines. This is the crew running the Lumia. That's me looking askance. And that's the computer station. Down below is the APC-40, which, is, which does shortcuts to get to the controls of the laptop. And that is Zeta. And that is the Lisa Zhu. And that's the crew for that particular gig. Meanwhile, we were also doing a show at the Hands-On Museum. So here we are setting that up, hanging the projectors. Kids, well, they didn't even wait till it got dark. They just kind of jumped right in there. That was kind of cool. And we had another new projector, which is called Rorschach and Awe. And that's what you were watching when, when you came in. We got the projector back here. When I'm done talking, you'll be able to go back and play with it because we now have the uh, interactive portion for it. And it makes the pattern that uh, you saw earlier. And people just love to play with it, and there they are. Uh, last year was the last big one we did. This is the farmer's market. We hung up a screen, and we had two projectors, and we had a dancer here and a dancer there, so we had two sets of people interacting on that screen right there. We also introduced the molecular disruptor, which is what, which is what you see back there. Uh, I'm not going to fire it up because it's four watts, and it's insanely dangerous in a small situation like this. But it looks like that, as you can see. It's made from highly advanced technologies. Uh, and but the kids had a great time, as they always do. And there it is in action. This is the inside of it. There are four lasers. There are little laser diodes. There's a blue one. There are two reds, because the reds are really low powered. And there is a green one. And they are combined using mirrors and dichroic filters. So you get an RGB 4-watt beam out the other end. So that concludes my comments uh, for Luminous Lasers. We'd like to thank the AADL for uh, having us. And if you'd like more information, uh, visit our website, Luminous Lasers. Do we have time for questions? OK, uh, let's bring up the house. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. okay, can we, we have, have the house, house up? up? I don't know that that's the right Okay, I have a question. How did I get into lasers? Uh, powerful drugs. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, my partner Wayne and I did conventional light shows with overhead projectors and slide projectors. We had one laser back then because they were very expensive. And we did that till we did light shows. In fact, we did light shows here back when this was uh, Federally Satyricon. What was the name of the place? Rubia, right. We, you can't see it anymore, but there used to be a private dining room up there. It's been walled off now. But Sunday nights, we would come in and bring a bunch of projectors and do light shows here. And this is like 1971. So that's kind of a full move. OK, any other questions? Sure. What's, What's the, the refresh rate of the uh, drawing, the logos and whatnot? Yeah, uh, I think the, uh, the Galvos are rated for 40 PPS, 40 points per second. So it's sketching stuff out really fast. The Galvos are moving the lasers up and down and back and forth under computer control. And that's how we do that, which is also how the, uh, the radiator works. That's a couple of... Uh, Signal generators combined and whatnot. Now, we do have back here uh, controls for the uh, uh, laser, and you're welcome to play, play, them, play with them. Uh, and if anybody out there wants to help us uh, do this sort of thing, we're always looking for talented volunteers, especially since now I'm going to be uh, starting to get into Arduinos. 
which I know absolutely nothing about. So I could uh, use some help. How do I, how do I mute the screen? There we go. Okay, so uh, go back there, play with the lasers. We've got a couple minutes, Eddie. And if you want to come up to me, I've got business cards. If you want to, uh, we'd love to have more people working with us. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, we're we're going to take a break uh, and give you a chance to play with those lasers. So we're going to take five extra minutes and take a 15-minute break. So go have your laser experience, and we'll see you back here in 15 minutes.
Okay, Nerd Night. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Okay, we're going to bring it back for our second speaker of tonight, Saj Chattopadhyay. And uh, Saj is a scientist and a University of Michigan grad student who, let me see if I can get this right, studies how molecules interact with light that's twisted around gold nanoparticles in order to understand or create biosensors, perhaps, issues? Okay, okay, I kind of got it. Um, pretty straightforward. Yeah, um, so Saj, in other words, um, let me see, I like this. So like, put it a different way, Saj spends a lot of time in a dark room uh, hoping that the small gold particles she's looking at will do something cool and interesting. Um, so uh, let's give a warm nerd night. Welcome to Saj Chattopanjie. Hello. Okay. So yeah, um, like was mentioned, I'm Saj. I'm from the University of Michigan, and I'm in applied physics, which means, and I do microscopy, which means I sit in like a dark room like this, and hope that small molecules do something cool. All right. Um, I also spend a lot of time in out in the world, just worried about state of things. So before I start, I just wanted to get to know what you all think when I say the word polarization. <laughs> Does anyone want to share? Politics, yes. We live in a very polarized society. Polar bears, Polar bears yes. So they're at the polls, sure. Yeah, so you have polarized sunglasses that help with like less light coming in. Cool. So uh, one day I was walking back from work after having done work at, in a dark room, and I realized uh, my research uh, to study the properties of small molecules was very similar to the job that a political surveyor does. Let me let me explain. All right. So a molecule is basically like all of us. It absorbs a lot of light um, and gets excited, and then when it relaxes, it emits light. It's similar to how we absorb a lot of news. So we listen to radio, podcasts, watch TV, uh, and make up our opinions and values and beliefs. Um, and then we go out into the world and act it out. So politically, we can vote, we can align ourselves with political parties, figure out our like societal beliefs, etc. cetera. Um, and the way, the reason I'm studying these molecules and the property I'm studying is chirality, so the handedness, is because it determines the function in like biological and chemical context. Uh, it's kind of similar to how people's political leanings can direct how they function in society. Um, and I have two examples here. A lot of biomolecules will make spirals, so left-handed or right-handed spirals. And one can be great and like how, what everything can function really well. And the other way can be a source of disease. One of the other really horrific stories is of a chemical uh, that was used in morning sickness pills. But one of the handedness did the job that it was prescribed for, and the other one caused birth defects. And not respecting chirality uh, caused a lot of pain. Um, the anecdote, uh, in America though, children were protected because Francis Kelsey in the FDA uh, said no to Big Pharma and kept uh, kids safe. So that's one good, she did, she did care about chirality, which is great. So how do I study them? Left-handed things, right-handed things, they interact with light differently. So just like we would read news um, or seek out podcasts and TV that aligns with our values and beliefs, uh, molecules are the same. That's what they like to absorb. Most of the light they don't care about, but when they're like, hey, this is the resonant light, this is what I want to absorb, they get excited. Um, some molecules, like chiral molecules, they care about like the twist of the light, of handedness of light. And that's what I think of when I think about polarization. So polarized light is when, so the polarization of light is basically the spatial arrangement of how light travels. And you can have right-handed light or left-handed light, which is kind of like how our news is, right? No one is just saying facts. 
do you provide context, which is really, really important. And uh, generally, the writer or the source of that fact has a, some sort of leaning to it. Uh, this is a picture I took from uh, all sides, uh, which puts news sources into their political leanings. And it's really good to know what kind of news you're absorbing. So the problem really comes is single molecules are kind of like a person who reads thousands of articles. They'll read like 500 articles from the left, a couple from the center, and a couple uh, 500 articles from the right. So just knowing that, I can't really tell what your political leaning is, right? So because you've maybe read one extra article that's right-handed or one extra article that's left-handed, that's very hard for me to detect. What, what I need to do is I need to amplify that. And that's where the gold nanoparticle comes in. So when I'm saying nano antenna, think very, very small. Think thousands in like the width of a human hair. Um, what these do, they're kind of like echo chambers. So I have often fallen in like rabbit holes when I open up a news article and then I open up a link and then I find people who have the same values and beliefs as me and then I see the same news just floating again and again and again and again and now I have absorbed way more than I started out, right? Because I'm in an echo chamber where the same news gets amplified. Um, here, I have a couple of simulation results um, where these are three types of gold antennas, gold dimers. You can think of them as left-handed when the left foot is forward. Uh, this is not handed, uh, so achiral when the feet are together. And then when the right foot is forward, it's right-handed light. And it does what an echo chamber does. When you send in right-handed light, or think of right-handed news, um, in a left-handed echo chamber, it's kind of rejected. It's not amplified much at all in the hotspot. For the handed antenna, it amplifies it a little bit, but it's equal to the amplification of the left-handed light as well. And then for the right-handed uh, antenna, uh, with right-handed light, gets amplified almost six times which means the person like reading just a thousand articles where 500 were right and 500 were left is now reading like six times more right-handed news and that difference I can detect. That's where these antennas really, really help. The other thing that chiral antennas do, they twist the light even more. What do I mean by that? These molecules are super small. Like light is super small, right? But molecules are even smaller. And it's kind of like us. When we are walking on Earth, we don't really think of the Earth as curved, but it is. It is not flat. Um, <laughs> what these antennas help us do is make us realize that. They squeeze the light. They twist it in an even smaller fashion. This is called optical chirality. And I have the same simulation results. I can do a bunch of math and make the same, same plots, same antennas. And what you see is it's even more twisted when they match. And it's like symmetrically twisted. So these are the same antennas, just flipped. And this, you can kind of think about the news uh, when you have a lot of context and it's gone through an echo chamber. The context kind of increases and it kind of gets more radicalized, right? So you have this light, which is right-handed, but even more right-handed to the molecule that's already um, predisposed to absorb right-handed light or predisposed to absorb left-handed light is very, very excited. And then I get to uh, observe when it relaxes. The other thing that antennas do, so let's say I act out in an uh, echo chamber that the perception of it also changes, right? Because if you mention an action to someone from a left-handed uh, left antenna and a right-handed antenna, this is showing what the difference of radiated power is. So just how the perception of your action, um, and the same action will be perceived like the antenna wants to perceive it. So I, as an observer, if I wanted to be like, okay, I have to tell 
what this molecule, how the molecule is actually going to vote. I'm going to have to figure out what its actual handedness is, not, not what it looks like because it's near certain antennas. So that's the, uh, the other thing that I have to think about. Um, yeah, like echo chambers can change the perception of actions and decisions. And these are, uh, this is my only data slide where I have a map of doing this. I mention this because I, may s I study at single molecules, right? I could study them like just looking at what a community does in a large fashion. Instead, I'm actually going up to each person, each molecule being like, hey, what is your beliefs? And then trying to figure out if they're right-handed or left-handed. And by doing that, you can see a difference in pattern. Uh, the same antenna, same handedness of light, just different molecules. You see a different pattern. This is one of the results. So that's very exciting. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. I, this is the first time I've presented my analogy to a really big group, so I would love any feedback on that. I also have a fun fact to look up. When I was going through this, I was like, oh, how do I explain chiral molecules? Uh, uh, Louis Pasteur actually hi, hi. <laughs> uh, hypothesized um, this from like crystals and wine barrels because they were both right-handed and left-handed. And if you made them separately, you could play with light, um, which is a theme today. Uh, I, my lab is wonderful. Um, it's been very helpful, and I'm part of Relate, which is a science communication uh, organization at the university. And I would love any questions. Thank you. For sure. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You had a question? Yeah. Oh, so right now I'm trying to figure out what data I can get out, right? Like I send in a molecule and I can tell if they are handed or not. For single molecules, they're not very handed. And so I really need to uh, amp up the signal. And that's where I'm studying the gold nanoparticles and how they affect the signal from the molecule. So, so most, yeah, they're like most people. They don't really care <laughs> until it's like important. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. There was another question here. No. Oh, yes. 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 Exactly. So, like, so light we think of as just like it's falling on us, right? And it's, but light ha is a vector, so it's it's oscillating through. And if you have circular polarization, you can think of it as oscillating kind of like that. Um, and the electric field is doing the same thing, and the magnetic field is just the same polarization for both. Yeah, and then you twist it and it just become left, left or right-handed. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so when you think of antennas, right, what you need antennas to do is kind of oscillate really well. And for gold, the electrons in the gold, they don't lose energy. They stay bouncy and like they oscillate very well. And I need it to be nano antennas because they kind of have to be the same size as light. So when you think of radio antennas, radio waves are the same. They're just much bigger. So you have like an actual thing you can see. Um, yeah. There's a question there. Ooh, this is really cute, actually. So for these single molecules, they float around, and my camera can't capture something that's floating. But for the little time that they kind of stick to my slide, they're bright enough, and that's what I detect. Yeah, it's a cute trick. No questions? All right, don't see anything. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Saj.
Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break now. So um, you have a second opportunity to play with lasers. They're still there. And uh, we'll see you here back in 10.
Okay, Nerd Night, how we feeling? How's everybody? All right, all right. We are, we've reached the uh, third speaker of tonight, Mary Skinner. She is going to be speaking to us about um, teeny tiny little proteins and how llamas are involved. She is the research lead at the Taubman, I'm going to get this wrong if I don't look, Nanobody, Taubman Nanobody Initiative at U of M. Okay, give it up to Mary Skinner. Oh, what's up? All right, I'm getting up here. Those talks were really good, so I'm like super nervous right now. All right, so, all right, I'm here to nerd out with you all about nanobodies, hence the title of my talk, Llamas Plus Science Plus Tech. Oh my, oh my. Um, as you can see down there, there is a GIF. And I'm going to attempt to do this talk almost entirely in GIFs. And some jerk earlier this week tried to tell me that it's GIF. And so you know how you get those words mixed up in your head? So if I screw it up, I'm sorry. But if you say GIF, you're a monster. And if I say it tonight, I'm really sorry. So if you don't see a citation in the slides, odds are the source is tenor.gif. Um, Unlike these AI-generated llamas, which you can find on our website. So to talk about nanobodies, I've got to give a little bit of foundational background. So let's just get into it. Uh, we've all been sick before, right? We've gotten either a fever or a cold, or we've gotten a vaccine, and we have this response where we have these body aches and a fever, and our bodies are doing something. Uh, so what are they making, you guys? Does anybody remember? <laughs> well, so for whoever said antibodies, that's correct. And I was going to show this whole slide about new exposures versus recognized exposures, and then I realized it was just an excuse to show Mortal Kombat and Mario, and it really doesn't add any value to the talk, so we're going to skip it. And we're going to get right into what is an antibody and what does that look like. So if, hopefully these colors turn out okay. But you can see on here, this is a diagram of what a conventional antibody looks like. And this purple region in here is what's known as the heavy chain portion of an antibody. And this pink and orange part is known as the light chain. And right up at the tip is something called the variable binding domain. And that's what's specific to a target. And when we look over to the right, this is what an antibody looks like in its protein structure. This is a model of it, obviously, but it's more of like this big glob of protein. Um, but what do I mean when I'm talking about a target? Um, so antibodies bind to, <laughs> I told you it's gonna be a lot of gifts. Um, so antibodies bind to very specific targets. And what do I mean by that? So this variable domain that's at the tip of an antibody is highly unique and highly specific to antigens. And what do I mean by antigens? So antigens are anything that are foreign invaders to our body. They can be chemicals, toxins, bacteria, viruses, pollen, anything our body doesn't recognize, an antibody comes, it seeks it out, it inhibits its activity. And we often think of this in the context of being sick, right? Like, so you think of an antibody response. But this very unique target specificity is something that scientists have been able to take advantage of and use for other kinds of tools. So we got more gifts up here. Um, antibodies can be repurposed and used for diagnostics tools, um, prevention of organ transplant rejection, disease treatments, therapeutics and prevention, and scientific research. And let's see if I can figure out how to use a laser pointer. Um, so you can see there's not a GIF up here. And the reason for that is because I'm a total narcissist and I wanna show you some of my own research. Uh, so up in this corner, this is a single cell and it has been probed with fluorescently labeled antibodies. So antibodies allow us to look at specific targets in their locations within a cell. And this weird white and black box over here is something called a Western blot, which I'm not gonna explain too much about to you, but it was an experiment where I could treat cells with drugs and look at different expression levels using an antibody. And so selfishly, I'm just showing you two things that I did that look kind of cool to me, but there's so many things that you can do in scientific research with antibodies. But they have their limitations. 
So because of that globby protein structure, they need to maintain that. And so they're really sensitive to temperature conditions, to salts, to pH, to their environment. So you can imagine if there's an antibody out there that's a therapeutic, if you want to transport it to somewhere very far away in the world, particularly in a very warm climate, that would cost a lot of money and be very difficult to do. They're also super expensive to make. Um, the other limitation, ooh, I'm like shouting into this microphone. Um, the other limitation that I want to point out is something called the blood-brain barrier. And I think people have kind of heard that term, but if we think back to what I talked about with when you get sick and you get that fever and that inflammation, it would be a really bad thing for that to happen inside your brain. You don't want your antibodies to go in the brain. So you have this protective mechanism called the blood-brain barrier, and only certain small molecules can get through there. And so an antibody is really too big to penetrate that barrier. And so things that um, target the brain you know, don't work well antibody-wise, and that's a good thing, right? We don't want our body to let all this crap into our brain. However, if you're thinking about antibody therapeutics that target um, brain pathologies like brain tumors or Alzheimer's plaques, it would be really hard to get an antibody there. And so the treatments that are out there that exist often involve invasive procedures where you have to directly inject into the brain or into the spinal cord. And patients often forego these invasive procedures because quite frankly, the value doesn't pay out for the pain that it causes. So that's one limitation of these therapeutics and antibodies. And yes, I thought we were going to talk about llamas. Um, so I'm going to use an excuse to show as many llama pictures as possible, and I promise we'll get to the llamas, but I'm going to make you talk about antibodies a little bit more. So, <laughs> so remember this, I showed this to you. So there was this, we'll do it real quick. This purple region is called a heavy chain. This pink and orange region is called a light chain. At the very tip, that's a variable binding domain. That's what sticks to the target. And over here, this big glob is what these things look like in real life. So then what in the world is an antibody? So we have this, again, this is this conventional antibody. That's what I hope everybody in this room makes as an immune response. Most organisms make these antibodies. And there are certain organisms out there, spoiler alert, that make heavy chain only antibodies. And those lack the light chain, but they still have this variable region. And you can further isolate that region, and we're gonna hypothetically think of that as just like breaking off the tip. And that is what's known as a nanobody. They also are called antibody fragments, but I'm gonna call them nanobodies. And so nanobodies have lots of advantages because they're so small. They're only 10% of the size of a regular antibody. Um, and because they're so small, they're very temperature stable. Um, they can tolerate harsh pH, survive conditions like the gut. They can access tighter spaces. So remember when I talked about that blood-brain barrier before, nanobodies have the pen potential to penetrate that, meaning that a patient could get a nanobody through an IV instead of directly into the spine or the brain. Um, they're highly specific to their targets, and they're really cheap to make. So any guesses as to where nanobodies come from? Yeah, llamas. Correct. <laughs> llamas produce this heavy chain only antibodies that allow us to derive nanobodies. And in fact, all of the creatures in the camelid family do this. So llamas, alpacas, and camels all make nanobodies. But weirdly enough, so do sharks. Um, I have no explanation for that. So if you ask me questions about this later, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> exactly, sharks do what they want. They're awesome. Um, so why, am I, why is my talk about llamas and not sharks, which are really badass, and I wish we had a shark lab? Um, but honestly, shark, we don't live by the ocean. There is in like the Carolinas, there's a nurse shark nanobody lab, uh, but we need to be by the water to do that and like salt water. Um, but why specifically am I talking about llamas? And the reason for that is this guy. His name is Bob Douglas. Um, I, I don't think Bob is here. I tried to invite him, but I don't think he wanted to come from the farm today to live tonight to the bar. Um, Bob is a retired science teacher turned llama farmer, and he used to work at the University of Michigan in the unit of animal lab medicine. I think I said that acronym correctly. 
Um, and Bob knows the value of animals and scientific research. He knows the value of humane care and use. And it's without Bob that, or it's with Bob that we'd only be able to do this. So we're really grateful to Bob. And right here, you know, on the right, that's Bob Douglas. And on the left, this is his prized beauty llama named Moment of Victory. And Bob cares about his animals, and so do we. So. Before we talk about how an antibody is made, we really need to talk about the llamas because it's really important to us that we get to work with these creatures. And so how does this work? How do you make an antibody? Uh, it's basically a series of an inoculation, a booster shot, and a blood draw. So I, I assume everybody's here has been to the doctor at some point and you've gotten a shot and a booster shot and not everybody, we're not gonna get into that. Um, and we've all had our blood drawn. That is the extent of llama discomfort in this. They go back to their wonderful life on the farm. I hope they don't forget about me, but they probably do. Um, and so there's really no harm done to these guys. And that is thanks to the work of, on the left, Dr. Brooke Pallas. He's a veterinarian at the University of Michigan who has a lot of experience in animal care. And on the right is Dr. Jessica Franklin. She is a farm animal veterinarian who has extensive experience in llama research and she's been able to provide us with some consultation to make sure like minimal distress is done to this llama. And on the left, I have a video here that I'm gonna show you. This is Brooke, you can't really tell from his plaid that that's the same guy over there. And this llama right here, her name is Fortune's Child, she's also a beauty show llama. And she's about to get her booster shot. So I think we'll be able, if you look real close, you'll see her give a little kick. And let's see if she does it. Yeah. So she got her booster. That's it. She's back out in the farm. She doesn't remember that it happened. She's happy. She's alive at the end of the day, you know, having her hay, living her wonderful life. And if you all, anybody out there have children, you know that this was probably way nicer than when they got their shots. Um, so it's really important to us that we get to do some research and work with animals and everybody's happy at the end of the day. So, okay. Off that soapbox, we have this llama blood now. What in the world do we do with it? And this is a chaos slide. And before I talk about it, I think we're probably already far into this talk and it's a 20 minute talk. So I will tell you that I'm not gonna go into a crazy amount of detail, but if you wanna corner me later and ask me a lot of, about a lot of detail, I will do it. Um, I don't know how many molecular biologists there are out there. And if you're not, I want you to trust me that these are very, straightforward and easy assays to do in a laboratory. So I'm gonna give it a whirl and try to explain this slide and not make it totally a nightmare. All right, so we've gotten this blood from the llama. We take that blood and we isolate the immune cells from that blood. That, those populations of immune cells contain all of the nanobodies, well, the heavy chain antibodies, we can make those antibodies from in the blood. They're everywhere. So anything the llama's made is in that immune cell population. Then we make what's called single-stranded RNA. We extract that from the cells. We make complementary double-stranded DNA from that. And from that DNA, we make DNA specific to every single variable heavy chain specific binding region that exists in that population. And from that, we make a ton of copies of it and then we introduce it into E. coli. And I'm gonna stop right there because if you're not in molecular biology, you usually freak out about the idea of E. coli. So we're gonna spend 30 seconds talking about E. coli. Um, e. coli in science is a really common tool. Um, labs all over the world use it for research. It's really cheap to work with. It grows really fast and you can make a ton of copies of it. And you can also, um, trick it into doing all of your work. And it's been engineered to be very safe for use. And so what, do, what am I talking about when I'm talking about E. coli in the lab? Um, this is a kind of chaotic cartoon that I think was described as like an EDM festival. Uh, but this is to represent an assay that we do called antigen-specific bacteriophage expression. And basically, we have tricked these E. coli to presenting the antigens to our targets on their surface. And in this population of E. coli, we have all of them. We have all the ones that the llama has made. And if you look up in that right-hand corner, 
This is what they actually look like under electron microscopy. Um, so you either think they're really creepy or really cool, depending on you know what that looks like to you. So we have this whole population. How do we get the, the targets that we're interested? Let's say we want this pink guy right here. What do we do? And what we do is something called a panning assay. So we take this plate in the lab and we coat it with protein that's to our target of interest and we pour all that bacteria on top of it. Only the bacteria that are expressing the sequences that we care about will stick to that plate. And then we wash it off and we have just those guys left over. And then we take the DNA from them and we sequence it. And voila, we have new novel nanobody sequences. And from that point forward, we can make these synthetically in the laboratory without ever revisiting that llama again. Um, so it's a very cool process. And I assume, I'm not going to assume, but it, you're probably asking yourself if, this, if what I claim is so easy and so straightforward, why doesn't everybody in this crowd know about nanobodies? Why aren't they everywhere? And why haven't we talked about that before? And the answer is simple. It takes a really long time to make them. And the output is really low. So to go from the llama getting its first injection all the way to having this nanobody produced in the laboratory is about eight to 10 months. It's a really long time and there are a lot of bottlenecks. And so that's where we come in. Uh, so this guy right here, I don't know if he was able to make it, but I think a lot of people from his laboratory are over in the back over there. I did a shot with them earlier. Um, so. He had this idea of like, not only should we make nanobodies, which lots of labs out there are doing, but what if we tried to get more collaborative about it and looked at where all these bottlenecks are and what's taking so long and why is this so hard? What if we made this better? And he proposed this idea and thanks to the generosity of the Taubman Institute, we about a year ago started this initiative to try to say, okay, where are the problems with this production and how can we do it better and faster? And so we're identifying obstacles right now. We're collaborating using current technology out there. Um, we're trying to figure out how to use this guy. It's a cloning machine that you can like clone 32 products at once. Uh, down here, these are some mechanical engineering students who are designing new equipment for us. So we're making new prototypes to try to improve the processes in the lab. Uh, we're working with a lot of collaborators and we also have some other cool stuff going on that I can't disclose, but hopefully I can give a nerd night talk in like another year and have some cool stuff to say about that. Um, so we've been doing it for a year. How's it going? Uh, we're at our one year anniversary in like two weeks. So I'm pretty psyched about that. Our lab is up and fully functional. Uh, we've partnered with several clinical collaborators. Two llamas have volunteered to give us their blood. Uh, we're really grateful to them. And we've discovered some new novel antibody sequences already. And I, I just want to take a second to highlight these two. Uh, this guy right here is Asa Huffaker, and he is back there. So you should look and point and make Asa uncomfortable and say, hi, Asa. So Asa is a fantastic technician in our laboratory. And Jamie Schnars, I don't think, could get out of work on time to come to this talk. And they are an incredible undergraduate researcher that we're working with. So not only are we interested in doing this nanobody work, but we're interested in making some positive impacts in the community and communicating more. So I'm super psyched that Nerd Night let me come and talk about nanobodies tonight. And if you all want me to talk somewhere else, I'm totally into it. So you know, have me come to your classroom or your library or your kid's birthday party or quinceanera or wedding or bar mitzvah or whatever. We want to talk about antibodies to you. Um, our lab is really interested in DEI initiatives, so we're trying to move forward with doing more to broaden our outreach to the community, and so we're, we're really hoping in the next year we can do more of that. Um, we've been really lucky so far in the unconventional collaborations that we've done. Um, these guys right here are from the Mechanical Engineering ME450 Capstone Design Program, and they're the kids designing new prototypes for the lab. And over on the right, we have Kayla and Ann, who are two high school STEM students who got to spend a summer learning some bench work with us, but they also got to smash a bunch of stuff in liquid nitrogen, which was really fun. And then, you know, we're also trying to work on reducing our footprint. So like two weeks ago, we got certified in what's called sustainable gold, where you're trying to use less waste and reduce your carbon footprint. And we're working really hard on getting to that platinum level. So we're interested in 
not only science, but in our community. And so with that, you know, please hit us up on Twitter, on Instagram, come find our website. We would love to uh, collaborate with you, do some outreach, or you know, just talk about antibodies. We really want to talk about them all the time. And with that, I want to thank the people in the lab who've worked really hard on this, and I want to thank you guys for listening to me, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have, so thank you for your attention. You're right there. Ooh, he's asking about concave and convex red blood cells, and I'm about to be out nerded in a second. <laughs> oh, no shit, that's cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> nice. Okay, so that wasn't even a question. That was just camels and alpacas have concave red blood cells, and he was wondering why, and I didn't know that about the red blood cells. So, awesome. Uh, you... Ooh, I don't know what that means. Tanako mosaic virus? Oh, tobacco mosaic virus. Sorry, I didn't hear you and I did a shot earlier. Oh, these bacteriophages right here? Oh, yeah. These, that probably is correct. They all kind of look the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, anybody else? Oh, my fiance is going to ask a question. Why do llamas get awesome names? I don't know. Bob gave them some cool names. I, yeah, I wish I could tell you more. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do Nerd Night people say more? Thank you guys for listening to me. All right. Here you go. Bye. Nerd Night people do say just a tiny bit more, which is... This, this is great, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Do you know what else is going to be great? Nerd Night again next month. So if you haven't already, put Thursday, April 11th on your calendar. We will be back here at live, same deal. But I also want you to take a moment and think about those neat talks you heard tonight. And think deep down, do you have a Nerd Night talk in you? Not to make a hard sell, but if that little nudge of saying, actually... I am very well informed about this thing that I think is so interesting and I might have a couple jokes about it in my back pocket too. And I'd love to share it with an audience that is here and ready to learn and ready to laugh. That means you should apply and go to our website, annarbor.nerdnight.com and let me know. But meanwhile, be sure to tip your bartenders, drive home safe, and uh, there's an EDM dance festival here tonight, so we are going to do kind of a quick turnaround, unless those lasers and that one slide made you think, yes, I would like to experience some EDM, in which case, guess what, they're going to be here until two tonight.